morning, it's always quite difficult to say the thing twice because you forget what you've said already to one group and not the other. So I'm sorry if I miss things out, and equally sorry if I repeat myself. Um, what's particularly dangerous, you might, the same impromptu gag might be made twice, which is, gives the game away. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk to you about the Anthony Fry um, exhibition upstairs, which we've called a retrospective, and obviously it's in the Roper Gallery, so it's not an enormous, extensive um, presentation, sort of 25, 28 um, paintings by Fry, but the, it covers the main periods of his career. Um, and I think I'm right in saying that it's the first um, museum show of his work, which is surprising. This is him, Anthony Fry. He was born in 1927 and died um, not much more than... Um, a year and a half, about a year and a half ago, in 2016, later 2016, I think. So I imagine he was alive when this show was programmed by Jenny, my predecessor. Um, and it's a great show to be doing, I think. I mean, I've, um, as you might have seen in various places, I'm using it as a kind of vehicle for, you know, saying some of the things I hope we do at the Holborn, because um, I think one of the things that's essential for a museum like this is that we celebrate local creativity in as broad a sense as possible. And Fry is a local artist. He um, is from the Fry chocolate family, Turkish delight fame, um, and uh, which is a West Country family. Though he grew up, I think, in London or in East Anglia in Suffolk. Um, but the family is, is from around here. His cousin Jeremy, who he was very, very close to, is also a sort of Bath um, uh, feature. Um, the famous Bath citizen, um, and, uh, and they shared the same sort of social circles, so the Snowdens and the, you know, and the Fries all sort of intermingled. Um, so it's a local, so it's a story of a local artist. He actually, though he didn't grow up here, he had those connections, and then this is the point I was trying to make, and completely lost track. Um, he came down to this part of the world when, like many artists of his generation, he came to teach at Bath Academy of Art when it was a caution court in the 1950s. Um, and then in sort of around 1956, 58, he bought a lovely house um, near this, just this side of Box, just in, in that sort of valley to the, um, to the left, if you're driving from Bath along the A4, um, and which, where he died in 2016. Um, so, um, so to that extent, it's a celebration of a local artist, an artist who, I should say, um, was commercially very successful. He had a gallery um, certainly in the 1960s, the New Art Centre that was in Knightsbridge. Um, and then in the 80s, and right from like, the beginning of the 80s through to his death for 35 years, he showed with Browse and Darby in Cork Street, who um, grew a very significant market for his work in America. He, 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 his work sort of got into a network of um, particular kind of Hollywood um, collectors. So that a number of people in California have his work, as well as in New York. Um, for obvious practical reasons, everything here um, at the moment is from, uh, from UK collections. So local, commercially successful, but he's never had, as I say, a museum show. So um, been sort of um, missed by the establishment, if you like. So it's very exciting that though a small retrospective, this is the first public gallery retrospective of the artist. Um, now, while I say he's a local artist, the thing that's important, I think, for the message of the show, certainly for his art, but also for us, here, in the way it sort of epitomizes what I think the Holborn should be about, is that he's a local artist with a kind of global vision. He, um, though he, his sort of home remained in, in box for 60 years, he spent a lot of his time um, abroad. He loved to travel, he loved hot, warm climates, and the discovery and immersion in different cultures. Um, when he graduated, he won the Prix de Rome, which um, I think still exists, was a prize which in those days, uh, you got two years um, residency at the um, British School in Rome, um, which gave you, as an artist, a chance to um, you know, immerse yourself in the Renaissance, classical culture of Italy and, and, and all things Italian. Um, and uh, he said, you know, even late in life, he said that from, you know, from that moment on, Italy really was his kind of spiritual home. Having said that, when he went looking for um, a place where he might spend the winter months um, in the early 80s. So he was looking around the Mediterranean initially and then ended up renting a house where he would stay every winter in Cochin in Kerala in southern India. And the, the culture, the sights, the, 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 the smells, the, the people, the landscapes of that place um, had a fundamental impact on his art. 
Um, he gave that house up in 2000 um, because the traveling from, from um, Britain to India became too much for him, um, but bought a house in Carmona, which is near Seville in Andalusia, so continued that sort of wintering in the sun um, thing, which seems incredibly sensible. <laughs> it's a good show for the beginning of February. Um, so, so that's what he did. So he is an artist who is local, but he kind of in his art he brings the world, you know, to here. And I think what's important, I suppose, also is, is, as an introduction, is to say that when I was writing the blurb around the show, I made it sound. I was worried that it started sounding like it was rather documentary that he's sort of painting these scenes of India, and it's not simply that. Um, he's an artist, like many of his generation, who were trying to negotiate a balance between an art which is sort of representational and is rooted in the world and in tradition, um, in particular sort of figurative tradition, the tradition of painting the human body, human form, but is also um, engaged with, you know, sort of modernism, if you like, the, the modern in art, abstract values, abstract um, forms. Um, so he's negotiating that all the time, and the art he made is not one which you know describes the world as he saw it. It's an art primarily of the imagination. It's based on things he saw, things he heard, things he experienced, but it comes from the imagination. He himself talked about um, how he recognized in some, some of the themes that he comes back to again and again, a certain form of hill, windows, windows, figures looking through windows and things. There must be some sort of unconscious drivers um, behind that. So he was very aware of the unconscious and the imagination as the sort of primary vehicles for his art, rooted though it was in, in experience. And I think, I suppose, one of the things I realised sort of late on um, was uh, revealed by a wonderful quote from John Burge, which is on the wall, um, with the wall text upstairs, um, which um, I didn't remember this morning. Of course, it would have been clever to check it in between times. <laughs> Um, but well, anyway, you'll see it when you go upstairs. But the crucial thing is that it sort of it alludes to the fact, or refers to the fact that, you know, like all great art, Fry's art is not one of description, but it's more poetic than that. And I think it's interesting that Berger, you know, as a critic, as a writer who started his career advocating a kind of socialist realism. You know, in the 1950s, Berger was the champion of artists who painted, you know, I don't know, docks and factories and working class interiors, but then went himself to live somewhere more um, uh, more um, sort of rural and primitive um, and and moved to a, a, a form of writing and an appreciation of the arts, which is much more poetic and allusive. And that's exactly what you see in Fry's work. So I think I'll establish that for me. Um, so the show begins um, sort of at the beginning. Um, his early works, there's a group of early works in the sort of first half of the 1960s, um, most of which uh, show these sorts of groups of dancing figures in landscapes, um, but very generalized landscapes. Um, all of them, I think, in, in the sort of setting sun or rising sun, it's not quite clear in most cases. Um, and all of them, uh, I mean, obviously, um, they're figurative. Um, which is a significant thing in the early 60s. You know, in the early 60s, the contemporary art is dominated by two things. On the one hand, um, abstraction, abstract painting, which was increasingly kind of pure and flat, um, large, you know, flat, colour field paintings. A huge influence on abstract painting in the early 60s was um, Barnett Newman, who did those, which I'll show you one later, big sort of um, flat, single coloured paintings. Um, or on the other hand, um, the new sort of representational painting was pop, so David Hockney and people like that, painting Peter Blake, painting things they saw in everyday popular culture, or by the swimming pool, Hockney's case. Um, clearly, Fry's not doing that, so he's making these paintings of the figures, so in a, in a tradition, but, from the, but imaginary and, and sort of suggestive, and they, I think they all have this idea of the figures dancing in the landscape have a, um, a sort of primitive, almost atavistic feeling about them. They're sort of Dion Dionysic, Dionysiac, Dionysian. Thank you. <laughs> the, yes, a sense of revelry about them, um, sensuous um, and and sensory. I think um, you might say 
This, um, incidentally, um, this only painting, which is sort of bigger than most of the show, it's kind of six foot across. It's a magnificent piece. Um, so one of his masterpieces, really. Um, sort of reflects, I think, his, the impact of his time in Italy um, in the way it's made. It's, you'll see that it's, it's sort of got an amazingly thick texture. Um, the owner was slightly worried that it wouldn't be safe to move, but the conservators checked it out. Because it's sort of, I don't know if it is actual plaster, but it's got a kind of plaster um, ground, which is thickly, roughly applied onto a plywood, it's painted on wood, plywood, board, um, and then he's painted on it. And it seems that he painted, it's oil paint, but he painted when the plaster is still a bit wet, so the paint sort of binds in with the plaster, which is a kind of sort of bastardized version of fresco. So fresco painting in traditional Italian wall painting, you, you draw out your design, um, and then you plaster the area of wall you expect to do in one day. In fact, I think each section is called a giornato. Um, and then you paint that. Um, you know, and if you're doing a figure, one day might be the whole of the, you know, the coat, but the face might be another day. So, um, and, and you're there in fresco, you're using tempera, so an egg-based paint, but you paint onto the damp plaster so the two become completely bound together, the plaster and the paint are one. So it's a bit like that. Oh, yes. So, um, um, completely missed out the thing I'm supposed to say at this point, which is that um, Fry's education, so he came from a very cultured artistic background. Um, his grandfather um, was a painter um, and had an amazing, himself, and also had an amazing collection of old masters, Rembrandt, Rubens, and so on. <coughs> and was the founder of the Fry Art Gallery in Saffron Walden. Unfortunately for Saffron Walden, he sold his collection of old masters before he set up the art gallery. So they have a huge collection of George, or whatever his name is, Fry, but no Rembrandts or Rubens. Um, anyway, he was... Um, an, 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 so Anthony, the young Anthony had access to that extraordinary collection, and also to his great aunt and her collection she, Marjorie Fry, was the sister of Roger Fry, who, um, as you know, was the great sort of champion and pioneer of, of um, the beginnings of modern art in Britain. He organised the exhibition in 1910, um, the year which his friend Virginia Woolf said all human nature changed, um, um, and called that exhibition Manet and the Post Impressionist, the first time that term had been used to describe Van Gogh, Cezanne, Gauguin. And the others. Um, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, so, so he's coming from this sort of Bloomsbury background of, of culture and taste, very conscious and aware of the history of art. And he goes to art school in the late 1940s after the Second World War um, at Camberwell, where the professor is William Coldstream. Um, and Coldstream would go on to be professor of the Slade School. I mean, Camberwell and then the Slade, Coldstream established, you know, more strongly than anyone. Um, a figurative tradition which is based on the sort of close observation of the real world. So Coldstream, as you see from this painting in the 30s, um, pioneered an art that was um, solidly realist. That he was the leading figure in the Euston Road School who advocated a form of realism, um, more or less political in its um, uh, engagement with the real world. Um, they were very close to writers like W.H. Orton, all on the left, um, at that sort of crucial, sort of highly politicised time. Um, but also based on a love of Cezanne, as you can see, I think, possibly, um, just that he worked with these sort of short, straight brush strokes like Cezanne did. Um, and it's quite nice that this painting on the map is not only a, demonstrates his belief in observations, also of people being observational. Um, so that's Coldstream. So that's so Fry comes out of that tradition of, a, of the, the, the fundamental belief in the close observation of the real world. And Coldstream developed a process, a technique of, you know, kind of measuring just all that sort of thing of the thumb to get the sort of scales right, and then transferring marks, mapping a form onto a canvas, and then using those marks to, to, to map it out. This is the sort of thing he was making at the time he was teaching Fry. You can't see it in this rotten picture. Um, but you will see if you saw this painting in the flesh, 
um, that the key sort of coordinates of the body are, are pinned down before he paints it in with these sort of lines, horizontal and vertical lines. So he maps them on very precise. So the relate, you know, there's really important that the relation to the fundamental thing for Coldstream and his whole tradition that he um, advocates is that sort of pinning down of the real world onto the surface. Some of you may remember there was a show here of you and Uglo's work. Uglo is the ultimate sort of cold stream disciple. This is another um, painting of Fry's, of the same theme, these figures dancing in the landscape. Um, um, and again, as you can see, the sun is rising or setting, I'm not sure which, but you know, that, that it gives that same, it reminds me slightly of sort of late Paul Nash as well, that sense of the sort of elements becoming part of the picture sort of, and a way that these figures um, and, and the story, the painting seems to suggest kind of relate to something very elemental, something sort of druidic and primal. Um, and notice only when the painting is on the wall that the, the, the landscape is less generalised than some of them. You can see there's this sort of clump of trees, rather sort of... Um, very kind of English-looking trees. It reminds me a bit of um, the views you get at Portion Park when you drive past it on the A4. Um, so it may be that, you know, I'm not suggesting that it, maybe this is just one of the student parties at Caution, I don't know. Um, but it, <laughs> it, things did go on, they say. Um, but, and it was the 60s, but um, I, the suggestion that there may be a sort of English setting for this. And I think, actually, I haven't thought about it so I said it just now. Paul Nash is quite an interesting point of reference for this, that sort of tapping into the kind of ancient English landscape, the sort of setting for, for these sort of very primitive um, um, events. Um, but this painting also um, indicates one of uh, Fry's other key influences is this fantastic painting which he loved at the National Gallery in London by Degas, the young Spartans exercising, and absolutely sort of um, embodying, reflecting that sort of um, desire for a modern art that is sort of rooted in tradition. So taking a sort of Greek, classical Greek subject and using the sort of figure arrangements that you might find in a sort of classical frieze, but turning it into an impressionist painting. Goodness knows what's going on. Um, so another, I've, I've got all the pictures in the show here, so I won't dwell on each of them. But here's one of his prize figure groups, dancing figures again, but now they're sort of, um, sort of almost melting into a single mass of humanity, um, cast into this sort of deep blue shadow by the, by the sun rising or setting behind. And the density of the figures, again, sort of reflects the other key influence that he cited himself in relation to these works. Um, in his travels around Italy, he was particularly struck by the frescoes in Orvieto Cathedral by Signorelli. And in particular, this, um, the, the, I assume this is the sort of Great West End, but maybe it's not. Um, if anyone knows Orvieto Cathedral, I'm happy to be um, corrected. Um, of the damned being cast into hell, you know, typically in these sort of great um, <coughs> Renaissance schemes, it is the sort of the vision of hell which has the most exciting and intriguing sort of masses of humanity, um, suffering and tortured though they are. Um, and I think you can see this is the detail of this section here. And I get a sort of sense of how that sort of mass of bodies may be sort of attractive to him. Um, and then here is um, the last of this group of dancing figures, um, which the, the title of which indicates that it is the dawn rising over the sea and, and um, a lovely sense, I think, these figures which are almost like drawings, so they're in paint, um, as sort of ghostly, you know, that sort of strange light you get as night turns into morning, um, as, and then sort of coming, almost as the movement from left to right is almost like the figures coming into light, and yet becoming even more diaphanous um, as they do so. And then in contrast, in this early period, alongside those dancing figures, he made a series of paintings of nudes. Um, this is an extraordinary painting which are almost sort of, in some ways, the opposite, because they're so incredibly solidly physical and there, you know, these great blocks of humanity, and emphasized by the, why that, by the way they're made. This painting, when you see it, is astonishing. That it, like the first painting I showed, is really heavily worked, and I'm not sure if it's just 
loads of paint, or whether, again, he's made a sort of textured um, plaster ground and then painted over it. But you'll see that, you can't see it at all, can you? But when you go upstairs, you'll see that the, the belly button here is sort of molded in plaster, not just painted on. It's a really extraordinary physical thing. I'm not sure it's the most beautiful thing in the show, but it is an extraordinary um, picture. And then in the late 60s, you see this change in his work. And this one example sort of stands for that, when the, it becomes much more abstracted. And he starts trying to sort of show the figure in movement, I think. Um, and, um, and, and um, of course, uh, you know, the key moment in the sort of artist's attempt to show figures in movement came in 1905 of the Castle and Brat, sort of creative cubism, an art which um, made, took the fundamental step away from trying to depict things as you s appear to see them, through a lens, as it were, to things which are depicted as you sort of kind of experience them in time and space. So cubism is the first art that recognizes that we live in four dimensions. <laughs> Um, which is why we see, you know, eyes around the back and all that sort of thing. Um, and it's almost, I wonder whether the, the colouring of this painting, which is all grey and white and brown, isn't a sort of, you know, a kind of nod to those early Cubist paintings which were similarly kind of coloured. The brown areas in here are actually pieces of paper, so it's collaged on. And I think um, that he used collage um, to sort of part maybe a reflection of his uncertainty about these works because it's an easy way of changing things. You, know, you can lay the paper down and until you've fixed it down, you can keep changing what you've done. Whereas if you're putting paint down, then the, 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 it, it, the, you, know, you can't afford to be as tentative as you can with collage. So what you're seeing here is a figure from the feet. So here are the feet. These are the two sort of lower legs displayed. So it's a figure, I'm not sure whether they're slumped over like that on their knees. Is the right knee and the left knee here. And I assume it's a sort of drapery going over the top, but possibly also a sort of indication of movement, as I say. And then um, there seems to be very little work by Fry from the 1970s. His sort of his, his, his output almost dries up. Um, and then in the 1980s, you see him come back to work with a, with a new energy and enthusiasm. And there are sort of various explanations for this. Um, he um, had a slightly um, chaotic or unorthodox life um, with sort of several women um, and children by different women, sometimes in the same year, um, in the early 60s. Um, um, for a number of years, he lived with the mother of his fourth child, um, who was a bit of a hippie, so um, their life was um, maybe affected by that. And then he met this woman, Sabrina, I'm not entirely sure when they met, actually, who some, some of his friends are sort of credited with the woman, who sort of, her, her being the force that got him back to work and got him refocused. Um, but I think also that in the 70s, he was distracted by the fact that she worked, she was the sort of executive assistant to um, Alison McLean, the, the, what would you call him, sort of adventure writer, where he goes down, things like that. Um, who was a you know he was the you know, the really successful writer of his time. So they had this amazingly sort of glamorous life, jetting off to different parts of the world for different things. Um, anyway, so this is Sabrina, um, portrait by Fry of her. Um, so you'll see anyway a gap in the show in the sixties and the eighties, um, and he comes back with this sort of almost unique in his work actually. This wonderful painting, very it's not huge, it's about that size, very simple, very pure. This sort of um, pattern of greys and, and whites, making this very simple background and then at the bottom, <coughs> rather dramatically placed right at the bottom, um, you know, sort of uh, undermining all the rules of composition as this bowl of fruit. Um, but you'll see from the title, it's not really a bowl of fruit, it's actually one of those sort of, um, uh, 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 sort of almost like trompe l'oeil, fake fruit in marble. Um, and I rather like the idea, and I imagine sort of deliberate that he's they do something that seems very realistic, but it is realistic, but it's something which isn't real. It's already a fake. Um, but I think, again, you see him kind of um, playing with this tension between you know, representing the real world and you know, the sort of values of modern art. And you can see this, you know, if you imagine it without that bottom bit, as an abstract um, painting. 
And um, I, I, it, it reminds me, where he had been to America in the early 1960s and fallen in love with um, some of the abstract painting he saw. He mentions Mark Rothko and Morris Lewis, you know, who did sort of pour the paint on huge canvases and then raw canvases and then stick them up to make these huge layers of thin paint. Um, but I wonder if he's not thinking of Barnett Newman, um, who, you know, was most famous for these zips, you know, one single, one single colour and then this sort of sharp line that runs, or a couple of lines that runs through it, that he called his zips. Um, here, you know, this is a very precise um, depiction of two shutters which don't quite meet in the middle, um, but they become, you know, like a, a Newman zip. So playing with the sort of languages of art, I think. Um, and yeah, um, as I say, his, his work sort of finds this new energy and impetus in the 1980s, and it coincides with him finding the taking this house in Kerala, where he spends half the year, um, and he loves the sort of intense colours that he finds there. I mean, both in you know in everything you look at, um, but also he's actually able to find these sort of traditional pigments. Um, uh, Will Darby, who I should said at the beginning, um, I think some of you may know Will Darby. He's one of our patrons. Um, was a great friend of Fry's and his dealer, and he's suggested and selected this show and he told me that there's a particular blue i don't know if this is it um, blue pigment that fry used to bring back from india because it's so poisonous you couldn't buy it in europe <laughs> um, the paint is all glazed i hasten to add um, so um uh, but yes yeah, so i think there is a sort of him engaging with those sort of intense um, pigments that you find in places like kerala um, and I think it's important, and certainly you'll see it's important later on, that he mixed his own paints. So he was bringing the pigments and then mixing it with the, the medium, with the oil, so he could control the intensity of the paints. And you see that really clearly in the work like this. This is not a huge work. Um, and it's a figure looking through a window. And there are two themes which recur again and again, the nude in the interior and the window. And I think there's something about what he's trying to capture about this place, um, you know, he said that one of the things he was exploring was how you kind of capture the character of a hot climate. Um, um, and so these sort of glassless windows, and then the contrast between the private realm of the interior with the new figure, um, and I'm sure that sort of slight sense of a kind of, you know, erotic uh, tone is deliberate, and then the, the outside world passing by, as it were, that you watch from within, um, one unaware of the other. Um, is sort of um, is one of the things he comes back to again and again. But as I say, his love of this sort of strong, and I think again on that theme of the American abstract artist, I'm sure this is a sort of reflection of his love of Rothko. This is one of the great paintings of Rothko made in 1959 that ended up in the Tate um, in the 70s. Incidentally, there's a fantastic story of Rothko, which is as a local resident, um, but absolutely nothing to do Anthony Fry, I should say. Um, that he, um, he's these, these, this series of paintings, which I said some of you have seen, um, um, he was making them for the Four Seasons restaurant in New York, a very posh restaurant in the, in the, in the um, Seagram building. Um, and he, he started getting very depressed about the fact that he was in, um, that they were going to um, that they were going to be in a sort of terribly inappropriate setting. You know, his art to him was very incredibly important, and sublime. So he made a trip to Europe for, for the whole of the summer. Um, he went through France and Italy, I think, spent a lot of time in Italy. <coughs> and then at the end of the trip, he came to England, and as well as London, he came down and stayed with William Scott um, in Paltrow. I don't know where Halitro is. I think I've been there, actually went to see his widow, but um, anyway, in Somerset. And um, so Rothko had a few days in Somerset, and then Scott put him on the train, probably at Bath's Bar, and sent him down to Cornwall to save Peter Lanyon in St. Ives. And um, with these murals in mind, they go driving around the countryside looking for a disused Methodist chapel, because <coughs> they visit a Paul Filer, an artist, who lived in a converted chapel. And Rothko gets this idea of how amazing it would be to get an old chapel and put his paintings in there. And it's such a fantastic idea that you could be driving around Cornish moors, and in the middle of nowhere you find this chapel full of Rothko's murals. <laughs> it's so much better than being in Tate Modern or something. Certainly better than the Four Seasons. 
Anyway, he didn't find one. So um, in Cornwall or Somerset. So, um, so yes, let's go back to Anthony Fry, um, the man of the moment. So in the early 80s, in the 80s, he wanted to find somewhere um, where he could spend his winters. And he started looking around. He knew he just loved warm places. So this is, comes from a trip to um, southern Greece, the Peloponnese. Um, this is a lady who ran a guest house or a hotel where he stayed. Um, and again, I think you get that feeling of, of the, you know, a tension between the representational, you, you get a very strong sense of this woman's appearance and her character and her dress with the jewellery. And then these sort of little vignettes of abstract painting, really, this sort of very simple series of wipes that define the shutters and the rug here and these lovely sort of pastel tones. And then, of course, the rich sea and landscape behind. And very much sort of anticipating what follows. Um, so yeah, so he finds the house in Cochin, which he rents um, for 15 years um, and makes a series of paintings. So one of his, there's that window again, which I said is a sort of recurring motif. You know, of course, coming from here where, you know, his, the Georgian sash, if you like, is replaced by these sort of um, glassless um, windows um, in, in the wall. Um, and, but what, another of his recurring um, subjects is the sort of the four poster bed that you get. Um, in that part of the world, which would be great to sort of, you know, linen, I guess, to, to sort of, you know, moderate the heat and maybe keep the mosquitoes off. Um, and of course, again and again, the nude is the central um, subject um, of it all. As I say, you know, it is all about, you know, drawing on real experience in the real world, but then creating a world that is... Um, sort of imaginary and dreamlike, I think. So this is a beautiful landscape. Um, actually, it is in an identified place, which is, um, I can't remember the name, but I'm sorry, it's in the catalogue and on the wall, I hope. Um, uh, of the exhibition, but it's, um, it's, this is the landscape it's around a place famous for a sort of uh, Hindu temple. So it's a place of sort of peace and quiet. <coughs> and the quality, I think, he captures you know, these little, they're not so clear in here. <laughs> I ought to say, you'll recognise that this picture looks nothing like the painting. Um, this green is really a sort of really sharp emerald green. Glows like an emerald. Um, and this area is actually deep blue, not purple blue. Um, this is the And in here there are sort of little spots of red which really shine out and give it this sort of wonderful, dreamy, nocturnal feeling. Um, it's remarkably like the work of Peter Doig, who's an artist who's you know, Two generations younger, or um, in that sense of you know, based on experience, but sort of capturing something um, just suggestive and, and, and slightly mysterious, like a sort of dream. Um, others are a bit more solid. Again, there's that window which suggests very simple suggestion of the landscape beyond, um, but with something much more precise. You know, a named sitter. Um, I don't know who Asharaf was. I suspect it was probably like an old spot or something like that. Um, and, you know, it's something a bit more specific in the way the bed is presented, sort of slightly ruffled and um, um, uh, unkempt. Um, this is a fantastic painting. Um, uh, um, it's one of a series he made on this theme, um, which is pretty self-explanatory. But I think what, I mean, what he appears to love about this is the opportunity he gives, it gives to create a painting that not just has sort of composition in this sort of upward lift, but but it literally has that sort of lightness of, of, of the air and of the kites. You know, he, he used it to create a sort of exaggerated verticality. So these are very beautiful paintings of light, I mean, thin and light tones, um, lovely decorative kites, and then it's sort of strings. Um, nice, there's a nice contrast between the lightness of those and these very taut, straight lines that strings down to these sort of minuscule figures. So, it's exaggerated so much that these kites must be absolutely enormous, flying out into space above these sort of tiny figures in the landscape. The kites are, I understand, a sort of feature of, of you see them on the beach and so on. Xavier was the gardener of the house that he rented. So again, you know, like that smaller portrait, this is quite a substantial painting, um, um, a mixture of a sort of very precise observation of an individual, you know, a known person who knows to him, and then there's a much more generalised, abstracted interior um, and exterior through the window. And as I said, that's the theme of looking, of um, either you know being uh, uh, outside, observed, um, 
unbeknownst to you, or being inside and quietly observing what goes on outside, recurs again and again. Um, and I think, you know, there's an extra free song given to that by the sort of the nudity of the figure on the inside and the interior looking out. Um, so here you see this nude um, watching um, an elephant passing by, um, you know, one unaware of the other. And I was told the story, you'll see that he paints a number of animals, a lot of camels, but other animals as well. He did crocodiles, but they weren't very good. Um, but I was told, I think by his eldest son, that quite late on, um, his, he, Mark, the son, said, you know, it's funny, you've done all these animals, you've never done an elephant. And that sort of launched a whole series of elephant pictures, um, so, um, of which this is um, there's one of the camels. Um, and this is a sort of, and this is gorgeous painting, um, and brings together a number of those themes. So here you are in the camel, obviously, um, and then through the window, two lovers, you know, one lying down, one standing. And you know, it's a sort of classic sort of um, way for an artist to sort of suggest a sort of erotic tension in a, in a, in between two figures. Almost sort of surreptitiously observed through the window. Um, and this, is, this painting sort of brings together um, really, you know, all the amazing techniques he uses. He has an amazing range of kind of different marks and different textures of, 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 of paint. So in here you'll find there's some dark marks along here and around here, which are actually sort of very heavy black pencil. Um, and then there are thin passages of paint, they're really quite thick passages of paint in places the sort of raw pigment is just sitting on the surface. And yeah, so the, sort of those dreamy landscapes I was talking about with the mango trees and rice paddies uh, um, is really sort of signaled very clearly here. Here are these um, camels. I imagine it's a scene, you know, not uh, unlike things he'd seen. The camels are resting at night and you can see they're tethered um, so they don't wander off. I mean, it's extraordinary. The sort of the thinness of the paint in the landscape adds to that sort of slightly lyrical, poetic sense of an imagined place. Uh, but that it's not a real scene is made obvious by the rainbow. You know, it's a nocturnal rainbow. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it, it's almost like he wants you to be clear that you know, this isn't a real thing. This is just a dream. It's a poem, in, you know, a visual poem, if you like, um, where anything can happen and real things are brought together to, to suggest and allude to, to something more imaginary. Um, and then there's things which are more real, like a form. Um, this is a tiny little painting, which is sort of very incidental in one way, and yet <coughs> rather magnificent. A lot of artists are very drawn to seafood. Um, it must make you want to work quickly, must it? especially if you're in somewhere hot. <laughs> um, um, but, you know, it's a wonderful colour um, arrangement in this painting as well. Um, and then this is more substantial painting. See, John de Brito is the subject. This is a statue, which is called, yeah, a statue. Uh, for I saw, um, I think I googled it, and it seems to be. Um, it looks like it's a statue outside a school in Cochin. No, Will Darby said he put it as a statue in the middle of a roundabout. I suppose it may be one of the same. Um, anyway, it, it obviously mattered to Fry because he made more than one version of this picture. Um, um, St. John de Brito was a Jesuit missionary in southern India um, who's always shown traditionally with this long star. Um, and um, here the statue has, part of the statue is this sort of umbrella, which um, I guess protects them from the rain and the sun. And you see it in, sometimes you see in statues in Italy, you see the Madonna on the sort of corner of a building. She has a little sort of canopy over her to protect her from the elements, I guess. What's nice about this, and obviously I imagine what attracted him, is that as well as the rather elegant figure and the sort of rather grand canopy, the umbrella, they're then contrasted with this bare light bulb that's just hanging sort of rather casually in an ad hoc way to light the figure up. And then again, you can just see there, there's a figure inside. Now, you know, the, we're now not seeing the figure inside looking out, but we're seeing, you know, from the outside looking in. Um, that this is not based on a sort of very close um, uh, representation of the real world is that the other version of this, which is called Monsoon Man, which I think is included in you know, the umbrella. Um, it's a completely different palette, I and mean, it's all mostly blues and greens and um, aquamarines and turquoises. Um, so, you know, clearly he's taking, you know, as I say, he's sort of inspired by a thing he sees to make something which is quite um, invented and imaginative. This is a tiny painting like this. Um, 
and so which maybe explains a sort of you know greater degree of abstraction, but rather like the red four poster bed. I think there's a tension here between this you know, amazingly sort of simplified organic figure, the nude there, and then the geometry of the tent. You know, these are poles or gyros. So obviously you've got the canvas of the tent over there, the green with the coloured splodges, and then something more. So this sort of contrast between the sort of the geometry that holds the figure in and the sort of figure line. <coughs> Unaware. Um, and that's another camel being led by a human. Absolutely gorgeous painting. Much glows much more when you see it in the flesh than it does in the banners outside or in here. Um, but it really captures the sense of a place. Um, and interestingly, um, I was talking to someone just outside yesterday who spent many years in Egypt saw that and he said, oh, it's Egypt. Um, and I don't, I don't know if Fry ever went to Egypt or painted it. Um, he did go to Morocco, one of the sort of seminal, you know, he said one of the places that had most impact on him was a trip to Morocco and going into the Sahara um, from there. But there were also, as you can um, um, you know, discern from these paintings, there were camels in Kerala, um, imported, I think, to be piece of burden, and also for the tourists on the beach. So it's presumably something he saw frequently. This is something which is much more rooted in real life. This is a portrait of Tom Stoppard, the playwright. Um, and um, it's very nice that um, he allowed us to reprint in the catalogue a piece that he wrote about the experience of sitting for a while. Um, and it's very nice, it's very beautifully written. I was told by someone who just sat down and wrote it in a couple of minutes. Um, but it is sort of very perfectly phrased and balanced and there's a very wry comment about um, how, you know, it took a long time. It has a lightness of touch, the painting, but actually took many, many hours and several, a number of sittings. And say so that he sort of adopted a pose um, and, you know, after a few minutes started regretting the pose he'd chosen. And after a bit longer was really in quite a lot of pain. And then he didn't like to ever let Fry know the number of hours he had to spend with the osteopath <laughs> to get over his face, um, to get his back straight again. And next to that on the wall is this painting, um, uh, um, which is a rather unusual painting. It has a strange feeling to it. So you'll, when you see it, you realize the texture is very odd. It's very, a lot of it is flat, particularly the sort of um, orangey ground. Um, um, and it's, it's because it's painted on tracing paper. So it has a kind of waxy quality. That waxy quality of the tracing paper comes through. So it's sort of matte. It's not quite the right word for it. It has a sort of madness that's not quite mad, if you know what I mean. Um, it reminds me of if the sort of encaustic painting, and encaustic is paint where wax is the medium. So you get that sort of, you know, the quality that melted wax has, which is sort of very matte and yet and dense, has a density. Um, and I assume, um, so 2000 was the year that he left India and bought the house in Andalusia. And I imagine that what you know, we see the influence of that landscape here with this sort of rich um, burnt orange ground and, and the, um, the wild boar. Um, but I may be wrong because, you know, as I say, you know, he, would, um, he would paint things, subjects, many, many times, um, sometimes on different scales, and long after he'd sort of, you know, seen the thing. Um, so the relationship with, between the pictures he makes and the places he's in is too because it, printmaking is very important to Fry, um, and also um, because he worked on these with uh, a, a chap called Jack Shirrett, who um, ran a huge, very important um, print workshop, um, which most recently, in the last few decades, was in Shaw, which is near Melksham, going that way, so very close to where Fry lived. Um, he died, I think, last year, Jack Shirrett. Um, and these are carborundum etching, so it uses the process of etching a plate where you, you, know, you wipe ink on the image and then you wipe it off and it catches in the texture. A traditional etching is etched, you know, a drawing like thing into the plate and then the ink catches in the lines. Carborundum, does anyone know about printmaking? I'm, I'm about to talk about things I really don't know much about. Um, so if you think I've got it wrong, do say. Carborundum is a sort of, um, it's a kind of silicon-based powder, very, very hard. Um, and what you do is you sort of put it on the plate and you can, so you can create a kind of textured surface and you stick it down. Um, 
and then you, you use it in your image and then you ink it and, and then wipe the ink off and then, then the colours will stay in the texture of the carborundum so that when you then lay the paper on top and you feed it through the print, the press like a mangle, um, it comes out and typically a carborundum actually the paper's very sort of textured because it's been distorted by the pressure of the, the three-dimensionality of the plate in a way that you wouldn't get the traditional etching. So they become a bit more like paintings. They have that sort of objectness that a painting would have. Um, so Fry used that. You see um, the other artists who worked with Jack Sheriff, like Howard Hodgkin, made amazing prints with him. And a Gillian Eyre has made prints, which is sort of sometimes you know, kind of like a centimetre thick because it, it's so distorted. Um, and they, because it's sort of such a sort of um, the, the process sort of <coughs> wears the carb run them down quite quickly. They tend to be small additions, and this is like an addition of five. Um, having said that, they're, they're often unique because Fry would work on them. So in this one, I think that sort of, if you look at the elephant's regalia on its head, it looks like that sort of hand done with sort of red splotches of paint and a gold leaf laid on. Um, and he also was a bit naughty with the sort of additions, and he might make another version of this, which is a slightly different size and so on. So um, they're a little bit hard to, um, to get to grips with his prints, but an important part of his practice. And then finally, the last two pictures in the show are from the, the sort of mid-2000s. Um, the, the, and this sort of demonstrates what I was saying. And this is a theme that he, um, I think, sort of based on something he saw in India a temple on the beach. Um, lovely, this sort of horizontality of the beach and then the sea and the sky, and the, the line and the horizon. And these two leopards and a human figure on the roof. And as, he made several versions of this. But you know, as I, you know, this is made you know, some years after he stopped going to India. So it just sort of demonstrates in a way that he would keep working over a theme and that you know, the, the relationship between the theme and where he was, I mean, he might as well have painted it in Wiltshire. Um, is, was sort of neither here nor there. And then the final work in the show is this gorgeous picture of Krishna by the lake. Um, it's, it's based on a story from the Mahabharata, um, uh, apologies if that's not how you pronounce it, um, about the god um, Krishna, who um, uh, a group of gopis who are female cowherds go swimming in the lake and they leave their clothes piled neatly on the beach on the edge of the lake. Um, and they're, they're sort of hoping that one, Krishna will choose one of them to be his bride, I think. Um, anyway, and he's observing them from a tree, he's sitting on a branch of a tree. Um, but he nicks all their clothes. So when they come out of the water, they have to go naked. And it's all highly inappropriate from modern standards. Um, anyway, so it's a subject I suspect it feels the same by. Um, anyway, he uses it as a sort of vehicle, this most wonderful kind of what's really just a sort of colour. Yeah, piece of colour abstraction. I mean, you get these lovely figures. This figure sort of waving from the from the sea, and then this other figure just sort of up to their neck in water. This is Krishna. I'm not quite sure what Krishna is. Uh, but there's an amazing range of um, different sort of blues, um, and a really good clear example of how he used pigment. So the sort of paint here in different thicknesses and textures. But these rich areas here are simply raw pigment that he's just plopped onto the surface of the painting. Um, it was slightly, I, was, I thought for a moment we weren't going to have this in the show because um, someone realised that there was, um, um, our conservator actually went to see the first painting I showed because the owner was worried it would fall apart. So no, that one's fine, but this is very good. It's, um, it, raw pigment was not only on these areas here, it was also all along the bottom of the frame where it had dropped off. Um, and thankfully, Fry's daughter, Lucy, is a picture conservator. So we said, do you think there's anything we can do about it? She said, oh yeah, I've got some of that at home. <laughs> so she went and sort of re, um, well, at least dusted out the loose bits, but I think, you know, helped refix the, the loose pigment. But it is, you know, it's very much part of his practice. It has, and you'll see the amazing quality you get from this just raw, pure colour sitting on the surface. It's really the most um, visually powerful thing. And, and, and unavoidably, you'll see that the picture is in this amazingly sort of burnished gold frame. So it's sort of the whole thing glows almost like an icon. Um, um, and that's very much a part of what Fry wanted. You'll see that all these sort of later paintings from the 80s he put into gilded frames behind glass. <coughs> I think wanting to sort of create that sense of 
the richness of the object, that by, you're enhancing that by sort of distancing it from us by, by putting the graphs a bit like Francis Bacon did. So it is, it's the most kind of visually arresting, beautiful exhibition, I think, um, and we're enthusing about it. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry. Are there any questions? Yes, I mean, it's very hard to tell what was painted here and what was painted abroad. Because right. he was, I think he stopped, I mean, he was going to Spain until in the last year or two. And he would paint in both places, in, they say, the subject matters. When we talk about shore, the Wicked Pond, or when you go through the lakes to shore. Yeah, exactly. So the prints are definitely made yeah. there. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else? How long have we been asked for a Um, I think, well, where it says private, there's obviously because the owners have said um, very private. He was one of those artists who had quite high end friends and collectors, so um, they're probably more private than <laughs> usual. I think one or two are, aren't they? I think the kites one belongs to Nick Mason. I'm pretty sure that he's put his name, Nick Mason, the drummer from Pink Floyd, who lived between Fox and Queenship, I think. Yeah, yeah, no, I know because I live in the Yeah, so, um, but I'm not sure about the Okay, so okay. I'll meet you upstairs in, uh, in the next five minutes or so. Thank you again. Thank you. 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 Thank you.